Hello, and welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as the social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders from the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today's edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series is targeted towards allergists, immunologists, as well as other healthcare professionals from all backgrounds. And I'm really excited for this conversation. It's a topic we have not addressed before. Today's guest is Dr. Timothy Bucky. Dr. Bucky holds joint faculty positions at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He is an assistant professor of clinical medicine at the Perelman School of Medicine of the University of Pennsylvania. He's a member of um, a couple of academy committees, including the Adverse Reactions to Foods Committee and Eosinophilic Gastrointestinal Disorders Committee, and he previously served on the leadership of the Academy's Fellows and Training Committee. Dr. Bucky's research interests include medical ethics, health equity, food allergy, and eosinophilic esophagitis. Dr. Bucky, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us today, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, Dr. Stukas, and to everyone listening. Uh, before we get started, the first thing I really would like to share is just what a privilege it is to be joining this podcast. Longtime listener, I actually remember when the first episode came out, and ever since then, I've really enjoyed the podcast and the content from it, and I, I really has shaped my training and my education all during both residency and fellowship. So it really is such a privilege to be speaking with you today, Dave. And uh, uh, for the listeners of the podcast, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Stukas when he came to CHOP to give a lecture uh, last year um, when I was a fellow. And he's been really extremely generous to me ever since then, including me to be uh, here with you today to record the episode. And as a trainee and now as a new attending, Dr. Stukas, I really admire the work you do. And thank you for allowing me to join today and to talk about a topic I deeply care about, which is medical ethics in allergy and immunology. Well, that I really appreciate your comments. Thank you. And uh, that's all the time we have for today. So thanks for joining us. <laughs> so, no, this is great. And, you know, it, it's well-deserved. And you are, you're one of the few you know, experts in this area. So this is going to be a great conversation. But before we get into the topic of, of medical ethics, I'd like to learn a little bit more about your background and interest in this, in this topic. Was there some poignant experience or interaction that really started you down this road? It's a great question. So my interest actually started all the way back in high school and high school, college, um, I had exposure to ethics and um, interesting ethical questions. And um, while I kind of knew I always wanted to go into medical school, I made the decision very intentionally that before, after finishing college, but before going to medical school, that I wanted to pursue some advanced training in bioethics. And my rationale for doing that really was because I thought it would help me gain a unique perspective and allow me to learn to provide both patient-centered care um, before beginning my clinical medicine training. And that understanding, it really has shaped how I practice as a physician ever since. That's really interesting. So you sort of were drawn to ethics, um, even like before medicine with the, with the idea always to combine the two. And then you actually sought additional training and earned your master's in bioethics degree. Uh, let me ask you a really silly question. What is bioethics and what was that training like? No, it's not a silly question at all. It's one that I actually get asked quite a bit and I'm happy to kind of go through how I define it and kind of explain what I think are opportunities or education experiences someone could gain in ethics. So bioethics, it's basically the study of moral and ethical questions and it involves things like life sciences, medicine, public health, technology, law, even policy. So you can see it's quite expansive. And that's actually one of the things I think is really fascinating part of bioethics is that it's the intersection of so many different fields that I just mentioned. When we're specifically talking and focusing on ethical questions in medicine, we often use the term medical ethics. So you can almost think of medical ethics as a subset of bioethics. And personally, how I often define medical ethics, it's the moral principles that help to guide the practice of clinical medicine. 
my training specifically was here actually at my current university, so University of Pennsylvania, really was a wonderful experience. Um, it was a master's degree, as you mentioned, it involved coursework and research. Um, I also took a mediation intensive course where I learned how to deal with conflict disputes. Um, and for those interested, there are increasing numbers of bioethics advanced degree programs, both in the US and across the globe. New programs are being developed fairly frequently. And some institutions offer these as independent programs. They can be taken in conjunction with an MD, uh, uh, law degree, MPH. Also, you can even get um, PhD pro uh, degrees in uh, bioethics. And while there's a really cool certification that you can obtain called um, being a healthcare ethics consultant. And a second experience that kind of helped with, you know, during my training was, I served as my I served as a member of our hospital's ethics committee as a resident, mm -hmm. and it was a really incredible experience where we discussed real time complex ethical dilemmas, and it was very illuminating to see the perspective of people from of different trainings, different backgrounds, because it really was a multidisciplinary team. And one more point I would like to make as part of this question is the. I'm often asked, you know, I'm a clinician, why do I need to be thinking about philosophy or why do I need to be thinking mm -hmm. about medical ethics? And so I, I'm hoping to set the stage for our talk today because it seems that when people hear the word ethics, they think of, you know, maybe philosophers from hundreds of years ago or professors wearing turtlenecks and um, students sitting around in a classroom having these very like esoteric or abstract conversations. But what I'm hoping that listeners will take away from the episode today is that medical ethics is actually very practical and it's something that they, like clinicians are already probably using on a daily basis. So that's what I wanted to ask you. Do you think that you, you have this unique background? Do you use this in your everyday practice when seeing patients? And you know, do you notice any differences with, say, how you view certain situations compared with some of your colleagues who don't have the same level of training? It's a really interesting question. So I would... You know, I have a couple part answer to this. So my first thought is that an understanding of ethics is really intrinsic to our role as physicians and when we're caring for people at all stages, you know, including their most vulnerable uh, states. And I expect many listeners of this podcast, even if it's on a subconscious level, are already utilizing some of the key principles of ethics in their clinical practices. Regarding my training, I certainly use it um, in my daily interactions with patients. I have two examples that I would want to share. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the parts of my master's degree was taking a course on how to mediate conflict disputes and really has shaped how I encounter um, dilemmas as a medical student, as a resident, as a fellow, and now as an attending. Not only when a conflict arises, but almost preemptively before a conflict starts to develop, I try to use that training. And one of the most important skills that I developed from my training in ethics as a whole was the aim or the ability to really assess any question or dilemma from all possible angles. You know, my perception and my personal values are going to be very different from that of my patients or that of my colleagues. And it's important for me to make sure that all of those perspectives, values, and cultural practices are considered when I'm making a treatment plan with my patients or when I'm making a decision for the clinic or for our hospital with my colleagues. And, you know, if I had one of my patients on this podcast, they would probably echo this, but something that they often hear me say is that when I'm designing a treatment plan with them and, or suggesting some sort of management approach or change in what we're doing, my aim is to find a plan that really lines up with what the patient wants for themselves. Oh, I like that a lot. And I think we're going to dissect some of those principles soon uh, and really take a deeper dive into that. But is there anything unique about our specialty of allergy and immunology uh, that really pertains to medical ethics? I think this is an excellent question. And my answer is a resounding yes. And I would love mm -hmm. to break that down. Yeah. So as allergists and immunologists, we have a really unique role in that we care for patients of all ages and all backgrounds. We care for patients when they're doing well. We can see them when they're very sick and at their most vulnerable state. We care for conditions that are acute to chronic, and we can see conditions that are both mild to even life-threatening allergic reactions. So when looking ahead and 
thinking about our understanding of the immune system and how it's essentially exponentially increasing and our advances in understanding genetics, ATP, the immune system. And as we develop new therapies, I anticipate we're going to encounter even more complex ethical decisions on an increasingly frequent basis. And another point I would add is that ethics and allergy and immunology is very expansive. Yes, it applies to clinical care. And I would like to emphasize that it's not just academics, it is private practice settings, and also as applications for research for how we're educating um, both patients and trainees. It involves access to healthcare, um, policy questions. I think it's very important that policy decisions are based in ethics and how we allocate scarce resources. These are all practical ways in which we're using ethics as allergists and immunologists. And I would argue that um, essentially medical ethics is applicable to any physician or any provider in allergy and immunology. Has there been a lot of research regarding bioethics and how it pertains to our specialty of allergy and immunology? It's a very interesting question. And um, I actually had the same question. And so, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I felt and I feel that medical ethics is really fundamental to our practice of allergy and immunology due to the diversity of patients and the conditions that we care for. But, you know, despite that, um, there really has been a shortage of research focusing on this intersection of medical ethics with allergy and immunology. And so to answer this question, myself and my colleagues, we conducted a review article on this topic. And I will say the top, the title is a bit of a spoiler, but um, the, the title of the review is Scarcity of Medical Ethics Research in Allergy Immunology, a Review and Call to Action. So mm -hmm. in this paper, uh, we designed a comprehensive literature search to identify um, allergy and immunology articles with a focus in ethics that were published anywhere from 1990 to 2023. Ultimately, after reviewing this, and this involved multiple allergists and immunologists, we determined only 21 articles had an ethics focus based off their content during that time frame. And we did find some interesting trends that I would like to share with the listeners. So when we broke it down by topics and five-year intervals, we found that from each of the five-year intervals from 1990 through 2004, there's basically one or two articles published during each of those five-year time periods. Mm. Um, from 2005 to 2009 and 2010 to 2014, it increased to four to five articles, um, respectively. And then in 2020 to 2023, so this is just a four-year interval, there were seven articles published. Um, and so it is our thought and something that we wrote in the paper was that the recent increase in ethics focused publications could suggest that there may be a growing understanding of the applicability of medical ethics to the clinical practice of allergy and immunology. And to break this down even further, uh, when we looked at the populations of the articles, six were focused specifically on pediatrics, five on adults, and nine on both pediatrics and adults. So pretty even split among the different age, uh, age groups. In terms of conditions, asthma was by far the most frequently considered uh, or discussed uh, disorder. And one of the really interesting findings was that of the 21 articles, only two were focused on immunology. So it mm -hmm. really was allergy skewed. And so, you know, really to frame this, so when we're talking about a 34-year interval, 21 articles is less than one ethics-focused publication per year. And when you compare this to the number of basic science, translational, or clinical um, articles that are published in a single issue of any of our allergy and immunology journals, it really shows how little of ethics-focused research has been performed so far in our field. And one of the things that I was curious is, is this allergy and immunology specific, or is this something we see in other specialties? So um, I utilize dermatology as an example because um, I think that our, what, we, what we address as allergists and immunologists, often the same conditions are cared for by dermatologists. So during that same time period, I looked at just one journal, the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, during that same period, and we identified 150 ethics-focused articles. Yes, wow. 150. Okay. Um, and in fact, um, one of the really unique things about their journal um, is that they actually have what's called an ethics journal club. So where authors write in about specific ethical dilemmas or ethical questions. And fortunately, I've had the privilege of being able to write two of those articles, but hopefully maybe one day we could have one of those type of sections in our allergy and immunology journals. 
That's really fascinating information. And my goodness, uh, I did not realize that there was such a, a, a dearth of, of re research surrounding this. Well, what about, you know, like education surrounding medical ethics in our specialty? Do we have standardized educational requirements that all allergy fellows in training must be exposed to during their, their training process? It's like you're reading my mind. These were the questions <laughs> I had last year. And when I was working, um, you know, when I was trying, when I was developing this niche. And so I was, you know, as, as listeners will know, the ABAI, it's a conjoint board of the pediatrics and American Board of Internal Medicine. So how I wanted to kind of understand this a bit better was I wanted to look at the topics um, in the outlines or blueprints of both of those board certification examinations. So when we look at both the ABP and the ABIM uh, exam, we see that ethics is actually a topic that's listed as an area of study and could be included on the examinations. But interestingly, on our ABAI exam, uh, ethics is not included as a topic. And so while I'm not suggesting that ethics should only be included in fellowship training for test taking purposes, um, really want to emphasize that's not the point I'm making, that I would... A thought I have or a suggestion is that maybe if the ABI included ethics in the certification exam, it would be an impetus to encourage program directors and fellows in trainings to review and discuss ethics as part of their um, clinical training to become allergists and immunologists. And likewise, for those who already completed their training and enrolled in the maintenance of certification, perhaps choosing some ethics-focused articles could be periodically selected and um, including ethics-focused topics and how to address complex ethical dilemmas in clinic could be a topic for talks at conferences. So, you know, it's my opinion that improving and standardizing educational requirements on medical ethics is an area that we could improve upon as a specialty. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's a stretch at all. And I mean, I think it's well established that, you know, the training requirements are geared towards, you know, certification and board certification. So um, that's an interesting idea. And I, I'm hopeful that, you know, we have certain folks listening to this that are in leadership positions that maybe this sparks a conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. And that'd be that'd be really cool. What about um, do we have objective data from like practicing allergists or even fellows in training in regards to their, their competency surrounding bioethics? So I would say to answer this question, pretty limited so far. You know, when I've spoken with colleagues and at meetings or on phone calls um, with other individuals who have an interest in ethics, and there are quite a few of us, they're, you know, they have performed surveys or talked with their own peers about um, their understanding of ethics, but how allergists and immunologists assess their knowledge of medical ethics and how they apply to practice, I think is a great area for future research and could be a great project. And so, if there's any listeners who are interested in this, I would love to work on it with you. And I think it's a, a great area that we could help to improve our specialty. So I think so far you've given us an excellent foundation and some great background. And it's it's been a wonderful call to arms of why all of us should really, you know, increase our understanding and, and interest in bioethics. And now I'd really like for you just to give us some basic definitions and um, we'll go through the four principles of bioethics and perhaps you can offer some examples of how each pertains to allergy and immunology and we'll kind of go one by one. So if you may, uh, can you just describe autonomy for us? Absolutely. So just to give you some context for our listeners, there's two people that you I would hope you can, after today, become familiar with or at least heard their names. So Tom Beecham and James Childress. So they are, you can think of them as really important figures in bioethics. And they were the ones who described these four principles that we cite very frequently. Um, and you can think of these principles as the cornerstone of bioethics. Um, they are autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. So to answer the first, or to discuss about the first one, autonomy, Autonomy is really the ability of an individual to make an informed medical decision in accordance with their personal values. And it's important that these decisions are made freely and without any sort of coercion. An example for allergists and immunologists could be if a physician were to offer a strategy to manage an immune deficiency and the individual is deciding which one aligns with their values. For example, deciding subcutaneous immunoglobulin and the timing and the frequency of that versus monthly intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. Um, the opposite end of autonomy is the concept of paternalism, which is 
basically the notion that a physician is dictating the care to a patient rather than the patient being a team member or involved in the making the medical decisions for themselves. Okay, uh, let's move on to beneficence. And can you describe that and offer some examples that we can relate to? Beneficence is this idea that we as clinicians are acting to improve the well-being of a patient. So in our specialty, this could entail a physician actively suggesting or discussing treatment options that could help improve the health of the patient. So, you know, going back to that immune deficiency patient I just discussed, let's use CVID, for example, offering immunoglobulin replacement therapy to help reduce their risk of infection is one way that we could improve their health. Um, another example could be adjusting medications for a patient based off their asthma control. Sometimes we need to go on higher doses or lower doses, add a therapy, remove a therapy. Okay. So um, tell us about non-maleficence. So non-maleficence and beneficence, you know, I kind of think of them as brothers or sisters. They go hand in hand. And um, non-maleficence is this concept of avoiding harm to the individual. And, you know, I'm a very visual person, or I like to think in um, concrete examples. So, you know, in our specialty, um, you know, I'm often using this one when I'm talking about food challenges with a patient. So, um, you know, I, we, you know, I and we as allergists and immunologists, we would recommend a food challenge if there was, you know, diagnostic uncertainty, not sure the patient ever ate it, or there's a reasonable chance of a patient passing. Um, if you know, the child experienced anaphylaxis to peanut last week and had a very large skin testing, serum testing was greater than 100, you know, recommending a challenge may pose excessive harms. And that's where that concept of non-maleficence would come into clinical practice. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, we have justice. Can you define that as it pertains to bioethics and maybe offer an example or two? So justice is the concept that actions such as providing health care ought to be both fair and equitable. And this is a really interesting one because in my opinion, you consider this on both the individual or the system and policy level. So an example I've recently been thinking about and recently wrote a piece on is how do we allocate a very expensive and limited resource such as omalizumab now that it is such a wide approval for food allergies and we have such a significant number of people in this country with food allergies. It would be quite challenging for every single person who's ever had a food reaction to be started on omalizumab. Um, and if you consider it on a stepping outside the United States on a more global scale, you can consider differences in healthcare and access to medicine in different countries. You know, as you describe these, these things, I agree with you. I think many of us are already using this in our daily practice. Maybe we're just not putting these, these terms to it. And, you know, the implementation of like this ethical framework into practice really sounds a lot like shared decision making to me. Are these the same things? And if not, how, how do they differ from one another? Good question. So first to answer this, I want to define what shared decision making is. So shared decision making is this process where we as clinicians work with patients together to come to a solution to a problem. So while an ethical framework and shared decision making are very similar, they're not exactly the same. So you can think of shared decision making as a piece of a larger ethical framework. So shared decision making really focuses on solving a problem in conjunction with a patient, where as a framework includes that, but also includes ideas such as building trust, understanding other factors that could contribute to a dilemma. Um, and like, as I mentioned, ethical frameworks can even apply to broader policy and systemic situations, such as how to allocate a scarce resource. Okay. Um, you mentioned the word trust. How does trust factor into these conversations with our patients? Uh, and what are some ways that all of us can really improve and, and help develop trust with our patients? It's my opinion that building trust is one of the most important things that we as physicians do. And one thing that I would really want to emphasize is that, you know, our patients have lives outside of our exam room. This includes their personal history, as well as this collective cultural history of interactions with the healthcare system. And unfortunately, there have been events that have resulted in mistrust of the healthcare system. You know, two examples that come to mind are the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis or Henrietta Lacks. You know, these events live in what I call the collective conscience. And we need to remember these events in history are still very relevant to our patients. And it's part of the mindset that they're bringing with them when they're stepping into our office to see us. And so, 
with establishing trust specifically, I think it's very, it's important to have very open and honest communication, you know, sharing what you know with the patient, providing them with the opportunities to ask questions, share their perspective. And, you know, also, you know, we need to remember to be humble as physicians that being truthful when you don't know something or, you know, if something didn't go the way that you were had expected or had planned, um, it's all very important in building this trust. And something I really hope to impress upon listeners today is that trust is not built in a single 30 minute visit, but mm-hmm. really takes time to de- develop and build with our patients. I think that's excellent advice. Uh, you recently co-authored a publication in the May 2024 issue of the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in Practice, and the title of it was An Ethical Framework for Allergy and Immunology. I really thought that this was well done. It was a thoughtful and a descriptive way to walk us through how to apply this into clinical practice. I mean, you pretty much gave us this framework, and there's a great figure in there that walks through 10 different steps to take in this framework. And I, I, if it's okay, I'd kind of like to maybe walk through that for our listeners. Um, so let's start with the importance of determining or describing the dilemma. You mentioned this word before. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Excellent question. And, you know, thank you for highlighting this work, Dr. Zucas. It's a project I was very excited and very passionate to work on. And the rationale for why I even decided to do this with my colleagues was that when you look at several other specialties, they have their own ethical frameworks. And I felt that it was important for allergy and immunology to have one. And so that's why we created this. And you know, my goal was that just as you mentioned, that 10-step figure, um, I'm hoping that people could cut and paste it on their walls or, you know, keep it on their desktop and reference it whenever these dilemmas come up. Um, That's why we tried to keep it to a single page, in fact. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. And I hope that listeners can use can use it to help solve any challenging ethical dilemma that they see in in practice. And that's why I designed it to not be specific to one specific dilemma, but really could be applicable to any kind of uh, decision that comes up in practice. And you know, going back to what you asked me about that word dilemma. So how do we define a dilemma? And what that means is, you know, defining a dilemma entails describing what the actual clinical question is. Um, For example, is it deciding to undergo or forego treatment? Is it obtaining consent for a food challenge? Is it discussing that we're going to do genetic testing and talking about what's going to happen once we get the results? Is it um, discussing how we're going to get access to a very expensive therapy or how we're going to get approval for that. Um, In essence, it's basically defining the dilemma is articulating what the problem is at hand that the clinician and patient are facing together. So is that something that like you have to say out loud so that you both agree upon that? Or is that more of like a mental construct just to help you set the framework? Great question. I think it's a little bit of both. I think that, you know, you are doing this mental exercise of just defining it and understanding the different aspects. Um, But it's also really important that you do say these things out loud with the patient. You know, the question is, you know, obtaining a consent, for example, talking about a food challenge, you know, you want to go through all the steps of the consent. Do they understand? Do they understand the risk, the alternatives, and making sure the patient knows that they're your teammate in these decisions. And if there's um, a discrepancy in what you, the physician, feel is the right thing to do and what the patient themselves feel is the right thing to do, um, you're saying that out loud and you're working together to solve that that problem and not just dismissing the patient and saying, you know, I think another doctor might be the better fit for you. I, I don't think that's the right approach. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, you, you're making me recall all of those times in my career so far, uh, and it will happen again, where... I'm focused on one aspect and the patient or caregiver is focused on a completely different aspect. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, you have to be on the same page. All right. So um, you, let's say we've determined the dilemma. Mm-hmm. It's been articulated. It's been agreed mm-hmm. upon. <laughs> Why yes. is it important to identify relevant individuals that are involved in the decision? Very interesting question. So, you know, the patient themselves is one person and, and, you know, with an adult, that is the person who's going to ultimately need to make the decision. But there may be other people who are involved and other people who could be affected by that decision. You know, I'm going to use an example of a child. So, you know, we have the child, which is the patient themselves, and, and they are 
part of this decision, but they can't necessarily provide the consent themselves. You have either one or both parents plus the physician. So you can see right there, I've already described three to four people who are relevant parties in this discussion. And um, when we're thinking about relevant parties, as I mentioned with consent, you have to be thinking about who's making the decision. So with children, legal guardians ultimately have to provide consent. Yet, um, with kids, I really want to emphasize this today, there's a difference between consent and assent. So with children, we have this idea of assent, which is essentially a child providing affirmation to undergo a test or procedure, you know, saying, yes, I would like to do skin testing, or yes, can I will do the food challenge, or, you know, asking the child if they agree. And, you know, at CHOP, one of the ways we define it, and you can see this on our website, is the age of assent is seven years old. So really understanding that we should be not just talking to mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or what, whichever legal guardian is, is there with the kid, but asking the kid themselves if, if they can you know, have an understanding of this is, do you agree with what we're doing or do you have questions for me? Okay. Why do we need to assess the capacity of whoever's making medical decisions, whether it's the actual patient or their caregiver? And then, you know, what are some tools that each of us um, that each of us can use to do so? So assessing capacity is very important when we're making these medical decisions. It's, it's a part of the decision that you really can't ignore. So capacity is this ability of an individual to make a specific decision. I want to underline that word specific. In other words, do they have the mindset to understand the decision, the possible consequences of that decision, alternatives, and are they able to state what they would want to do? Can they give you a clear preference? It's, you know, oftentimes I see that people interchange these two words, and I, and I want to kind of talk through this idea of capacity versus competency, because they're not synonyms, and sometimes people do use them as synonyms. So capacity is this idea that um, an individual has a capability to make a specific decision, and that ability or that capacity can change with each decision. You could have capacity to make decision A, but not decision B, um, as opposed to competency is this global evaluation of the patient, and that's actually a legal designation by the judicial system. So with capacity itself, the other caveat, and I really want to emphasize this, is that any physician can determine this. It does not mean, need to be determined by a psychiatrist or psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to note that you know capacity for an individual can change day to day, and it can be situation specific. You know, a patient could be fully cognizant and fully understand a decision today, and then tomorrow, unfortunately, develop altered mental status, and then they would no longer have capacity. So it is a very dynamic concept. And when the patient is determined to not have capacity, that's when we need to get a surrogate decision maker to step in and help us um, come to a decision. The fourth step in the framework, it seems really obvious, but of course, the devil's always in the details. So in the midst of a busy clinical practice, how can we effectively discuss all relevant management strategies and treatment options with each patient? Uh, my approach for this is pretty simple. You know, be honest and be upfront. I think those are the key things. You know, for example, I'm going to use uh, food allergies here. Um, we have the options of, you know, we have avoidance, we have oral immunotherapy, we have omalizumab, we have the combination of oral immunotherapy and omalizumab. And it's important that we go through all of those options. And, you know, if we're talking about something like immunoglobulin replacement, we have, we can talk about, I mean, uh, IVIG or subcutaneous immunoglobulin, and we need to discuss both of those two, depending on the immune deficiency. You know, for others, we might be talking about um, gene therapy, bone marrow transplant, or antibiotic prophylaxis. So based off the specific situation, it's really important to take the time, and I know this does take extra time, but it's important to take the time and have these honest upfront conversations. Do you, do you try to have handouts so people can review after the fact, or what, you know, what are some of the practical ways that you utilize this in your practice? I think handouts are a great idea. I think providing them with um, other resources that they can go to look to or reference later on. Um, you know, once again, if I had my patients on this podcast today, they would tell you that I'm no stranger to giving people URLs or telling them to go to a website to read a bit more. Um, for example, with immune deficiency, I'm often referencing the Immune Deficiency Foundation and asking patients to, to read a bit more about it before they see me again. And I will intentionally schedule follow-up visits 
to um, discuss their questions or their concerns and really focus my second visit on that. Um, you know, if I'm gonna, if I'm making a new diagnosis of an immune deficiency, I will say, you know, this is how I would do it. I would get the labs, talk, get the history. If that all fits with a, a, a possible immune deficiency, I will kind of make that diagnosis and share that with the patient, give them some resources to read about, and then fairly for like fairly soon, you know, anywhere from one to two to four weeks later, I will have them come back and say, bring me a list of questions. You know, my job is to be your educator on this topic. I had the training to do this and let me explain whatever doesn't make sense to you. So I, I specifically schedule time for this with patients. Oh, that's a great idea. Uh, if we go back to the framework, step five is to describe the ethical principles underlying the dilemma. What does that actually look like with each interaction? So one of the very intentional things when we did with this framework was to not make it specific to a single situation. I wanted this to be generalizable so that you could use it for whatever kind of complex scenario you're encountering in clinic. So, you know, when we're utilizing it, we're asking each patient to, or when we're utilizing this step, we're using those four principles that we discussed earlier, and then we're applying it to the specific scenario that we have on hand. We're also considering if the patient has the ability to provide consent and if they have provided consent already. Um, this is an important point to assess the level of trust between ourselves and our patients. And, you know, if you look at that figure that we're uh, referencing, trust is actually on the right hand side on that Y axis. And that was intentional because I think trust is built during each of those steps. But I think this step five is a particular place where we can, you know, have a check in with the patient, make sure that the patient is continuing to understand, ask their questions, and then we're continuing to build trust. And, um, you know, this might be a good checkpoint halfway through these steps to reassess the trust that we've are building or have built with our patients. Okay. What are some examples of additional factors that are mentioned in step six that we should consider that may impact decision making? Mm, great question. So this step, um, this is where I'm going to reference the lives patients have outside of our clinic. Um, the time that it takes to come to see us, to undergo a food challenge, the time it takes to um, receive those IVIG or subcutaneous infusions, the financial expenses, um, that's a very realistic part of this decision that we have to consider. And also access as a whole, you know, um, that can be health literacy, it can be time, it can be what day of the week they're able to come to clinic. And these practical aspects are very important components that underlie the decisions that our patients are making, and we need to be cognizant of those. Okay. Um, let's talk about values for a second. How do the individual values of each patient or their caregiver really come into play? And what's the role of the healthcare professional in eliciting them? Assessing patient values, you know, is really an important job in our role as physicians. You know, if we are not seeking to elicit them, we could essentially skew towards that, you know, paternalistic model or dictating care to our patients, you know, where we basically say, I am the doctor, you're going to do this. Um, and I don't think that's the right approach to healthcare. Um, but by understanding and taking the time to elicit those values from patients, we can help to design treatment plans that align with patients' goals for themselves. Um, I'm gonna use a different example here. Um, a big part of my clinical practice is eosinophilic esophagitis. And a question that I often will talk about with patients is what of the different options we have? You know, we have steroids, we have uh, proton pump inhibitors, we have du dupilumab, um, we have diet elimination. Which of those could line up with what you want for themselves? So to break that down, um, do you prefer to take a medicine once or twice a day? Would you prefer to take an injection that's less frequent? Or are you someone who says, you know, doc, if I cannot take a medicine, that would be my preference. Let's do the uh, food elimination approach. And so that's a very practical way in which I would try to elicit my values from patients or elicit values from patients. And, um, and the question on how to do it, you would ask me is very simple. Ask them, ask your patients, um, give them the opportunity to share with you what's important to them and how what's important to them can align with one of those um, treatment options. 
No, I think that's really valuable. And, and I, I couldn't agree more with the importance of doing that. And we'll be surprised, right? So we, we may want a certain uh, outcome or, or a approach, and our patients may have a completely different opinion on this, uh, what's important to them. So step eight uh, involves assessment of the patient's understanding. Uh, once again, the, the question is, how can we do this in an efficient and effective manner during these interactions? Yeah. So the approach I take with this, um, this is something we're all taught, you know, medical school, residency, fellowship, and um, it's that teach back method. Asking mm -hmm. patients to explain back the decision, um, to explain back the procedure um, is a great way to see if they have understanding. And that is also a great opportunity to highlight some areas that maybe they still have some questions on. And it's an opportunity for you to ask those lingering questions or provide clarifications. And so that's typically how I would approach that step. We talked about capacity before, but what about health literacy? Does that come into play? Do we need to assess that? I'm, I'm sure not everybody has the same ability to make these decisions or understand things. Absolutely. I think health literacy is absolutely something that we should be considering and we should be incorporating in our decisions. And, you know, it's not such a simple thing like taking a test and understanding, like, do you understand what a food allergy is or what eosinophilic esophagitis is? But it's an understanding that, you know, do they understand the different medications and the side effects or possible risk or benefits with those? And it's, um, you know, a, more of that global type assessment of are they seeming to comprehend the information and Maybe sometimes we have to break down the information a bit further so it's more understandable for a patient. And, and this is really where I feel that we as physicians need to meet patients where they're at and we need to provide care that's really tailored to each patient. So what is right for patient A and how we explain it is going to be very different from what's right for patient B. And how we explain it or how we break it down, we really need to individualize that. Okay. Uh, as we near the end of the 10 steps, step nine brings in shared decision making and having that discussion. You sort of already addressed the importance of this uh, previously, but uh, any other thoughts now that we sort of walk through the process in more detail? Yeah, a part that I would add here, and we haven't really discussed this so far today, is that, you know, shared decision making is not, not necessarily you're doing one time. Um, it's something that you're doing on your first visit and on your 20th visit with that same patient. It's really taking that time to engage in a dialogue with patients on their treatment options and, you know, continue to check in is, is this working for you? Is this not working for you? Are you wanting to switch to something else? And, and, in, and I really want to emphasize, it's not just a simple yes or no, is this working? It's asking patients to really explain is, you know, what are their questions, concerns, and um, do we need to make adjustments to what we're currently doing? Okay. Um, so as we near the end of the framework here, uh, let's say, obviously, if a decision is reached and everybody feels comfortable with that, uh, it seems like that's the best way to kind of find a path to move forward. But what happens if you go through this entire process and somebody can't make a decision? It's a great question. Um, it is one that I think this is another great example where we as allergist immunologists, this is something where we are, we do face. Um, and it's something that I would I'm wondering if many of the listeners of this episode today have encountered themselves. So, you know, if a patient does not have capacity, um, and as we talked about, you know, uh, capacity can really change based off each decision and can change day to day. So you, if on day one, they don't have capacity or it's determined you as the physician, and once again, you do not need a psychiatrist to do this, you as the physician can do this, um, you may need to revisit it on a different day. Or if it seems like that patient themselves, for example, if they're sedated and intubated and they can't make that decision, then we that's when we need to step in and find a surrogate decision maker. Um, you know, I'm going to go back to that uh, eosinophilic esophagitis example that I talked about before because it's a big part of my clinical practice. So when we talk about eosinophilic esophagitis, a, a way I would emphasize this with patients is that it is a chronic condition um, and it's almost unfair to force a patient to have to make a decision that they're going to commit to for life within the short context of a 30 minute visit. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you have to have the patient come back. Sometimes it's a phone call later that day or a few days later, or sometimes it's, um, you know, revisiting even a year or two later, asking them, is this working? Do you have different questions? And, you know, sometimes patients might need to spend some time talking about people or loved ones in their lives that, um, is what they're doing kind of working for them. So 
What I would say with this step is I would really emphasize that a decision is not made in a single office visit. And, and for listeners, that's okay. And in fact, sometimes it's better in the long run. You know, as you discuss all of this, um, I keep thinking so many of us get kind of caught up in our own heads during these visits of we know we're already behind by three patients or what's waiting for us next or we have to click all the boxes and close the charts and answer the emails and everything like that. But for that patient that's in front of us, um, these can be really big decisions that are going to dramatically impact their lives. Uh, and just r sort of reframing this of, like you said, let's take the time to walk through this and help them come to a decision that they're comfortable with. I, I think that if we can adopt this, it would make our jobs much more satisfying, right? I mean, it, it sounds like you have tremendous satisfaction from these conversations and taking this approach. You know, I absolutely love my job. Um, I, you know, I, I think many people will say medicine is a calling and I, I, I truly do smile walking into work every day and I love my patients. And I think that we as allergists and immunologists can really help people feel better. And that's a pretty amazing skill. And, you know, I'm a new attending and I understand there are a lot of pressures of seeing a certain number of patients, closing your charts on time, getting those lab results addressed. But you have to remember that for that patient who's sitting in front of you, these conversations can have really long-term consequences. And it's my opinion that it's really, it's really our responsibility to take this time to discuss these decisions in detail with our patients. And, you know, like I said, I don't expect you to be able to do this in a, in a short single visit, but this is an opportunity to maybe have them come back sooner or talk to them again. But um, it's part of our role as physicians. And as you know, we are caregivers, right? We are helping mm -hmm. patients feel well, that we are coming up with plans that really work for our patients. And I'll just add, um, if I may, that it's not something that any of us are going to be perfect at the first time we do it, right? It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of practice with, you know, how do you have the conversation? Uh, how do you do this in an efficient manner? Um, so yeah, I, I, but it's extremely valuable. If I can add, uh, listeners can't hear me, but I am vigorously nodding my head to what ah. Dr. Chris is saying, because it is true. It's This is not something that I am perfect at that I expect any listener to be perfect at, but um, this is where I kind of go back to, I think it's an important area that we should have more education and training in, um, you know, either it's during our fellowship training or afterwards at meetings, but these are practical um, skills that we are utilizing frequently. And, and the other thing I want to add is, in my opinion, I think patients are happier with their care and more satisfied when they feel that they're heard. So this actually not only leaves us with, as you mentioned, Dr. Stuick, is with um, better provider satisfactions, but I think patients are happier with their experience with healthcare. And it really does help to build that trust with the healthcare system if we're taking the time to listen to them. Ah, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, we're, we're kind of nearing the end of our, our conversation here, and you've given us such tremendous background. You've really taken a deep dive into the principles surrounding these conversations and medical ethics. Um, but would it be okay if we just discussed a couple of quick hypothetical cases and you can give us some thoughts on how medical ethics can help navigate each situation? It'd be my pleasure. All right. So let's go with a scenario that I see pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. um, let's say that we have parents of a school-age child who mm -hmm. has a history of peanut and or tree nut allergies, and these parents desperately want them to be treated, especially mm -hmm. before they go off to school. But yes. the child has an aversion to the taste, so they don't mm -hmm. want to eat the food, and they're also deathly scared of needles. So uh, you know, this, of course, addresses oral immunotherapy and omalizumab. Mm -hmm. can, you walk us, can you walk us through how to navigate this from an ethical standpoint? That's a great question. And likewise, I, I see this very frequently, and I expect this is an example um, of where Ethics is something that I expect many listeners of this podcast are already doing or already applying. So how would I address this? Um, first, I would seek to provide education on all the different treatment options for food allergies that you'd mentioned. Um, I would aim to understand what the parent's goals are for their child. Are they hoping to have their child, you know, um, have a, are they hoping to prevent anaphylaxis? Are they hoping to possibly allow that patient to eat that food freely? You know, it's not for everyone, but sometimes that is the outcome with uh, oral immunotherapy. Um, so that would be one step. What is the parent or the, or the legal guardian's goals for their kid? The second thing is I would take the time to speak with the kid. Um, and this is another thing if my patients were here in clinic, 
um, with my pediatric patients, I actually sit up on my exam table next to them and I ask them to tell me what they're afraid of and what are they worried about? You know, why are they afraid of needles? Did they have a bad experience before? Um, you know, can they tell me what part of the taste is really uncomfortable for them? And I also ask them to tell me a little bit about um, what would help them feel that they are no different from their friends at school um, who don't have food allergies? You know, is there something that um, makes them feel like they are a little bit different or stands out? And how can I kind of help them to not feel that way? Um, and so I'm going to try to answer both the parents and their child or the patient's question and walk through each of those steps of the framework that we've talked about today. And, and I do think this is often a great example where it is okay to not get an answer in a single visit. It is okay to say to the parents, you know, you do not have to commit to um, frequent injections or daily oral immunotherapy dosing for, for the next several years after our short visit today. Think about it. We can talk about it more. Write down all your questions for me. I love when patients come in with a list of questions because it, it tells me that they've thought about it. Um, they've thought about it at home. And we can continue to discuss this together. But I think this is a great opportunity to implement this framework and those 10 steps that we've kind of gone through today. All right. Great advice. And I see you kind of bring it all full circle. So let's discuss one more scenario. And this is one that you've written about in an editorial. And I read this and I thought it was just fascinating. So this was an interesting uh, hypothetical example of a woman who has a common variable immune deficiency who, you know, after discussion, understanding of risks and benefits, she, to this point, has really refused treatment with immunoglobulin replacement. She said, this is not something that, that is important to me. But now she becomes pregnant mm -hmm. and she continues to not want treatment. So mm -hmm. how can medical ethics help navigate the balance of not only her health, but of the baby as well? Yeah. And um, so, yes, I thought it was a fascinating qu uh, question. And I was really proud of this piece um, and for the content, but also it was an opportunity to work with a very personal mentor to me, uh, Dr. Kate Sullivan. She's also my uh, my boss at CHOP. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, she has been such a great supporter and all of my um, my supervisors at Penn and Top have been very supportive of this um, interest of mine. And so, you know, want to break this down further. So there are several groups that, you know, when we, we, quote, we call them quote unquote vulnerable. And when I say that, I'm talking about in terms of both research and clinical care. Um, pregnancy is one of them. Children and incarcerated individuals are the other two that we often think about. There are more, but those are the ones we often think about first. Um, so, and, and listeners, if you have time, I really encourage you to read it because I think it's a piece that you may very realistically encounter. And the question is, how do you weigh the risk and benefits of IVIG hesitancy or sub-Q um, uh, immunoglobulin hesitancy in pregnancy? And, and the question is, there are implications for this with the mother. Once she becomes pregnant, there are implications for the newborn. And the question is, when do physicians have to intervene? I think it's not a simple answer, but it's a question that I find really interesting and um, I'm hoping to study further. Um, and are we doing other things to possibly to support that patient if it's not the immunoglobulin infusions? For example, are they getting vaccinated? Are they masking? Maybe they work from home and their risk of infection is quite low. And, and asking the, the mother to really break down, why are you concerned or what are your fears? And does this change with now that you're pregnant? Or can, we, can I maybe provide some information about what possible repercussions are for the for the, the newborn after they're born, because, you know, you know, in the CVID example, the concern would be that the, the newborn would have very, very little humoral immunity once they're born because they wouldn't get that passive um, IgG from the mother through the placenta. And so this question of when to intervene, I think is really interesting. And another example that's not in this piece, but another one I'm hoping to think about someday is when do we as physicians need to intervene for bone marrow transplant for immune deficiencies? You know, some patients we medically manage, but we know that there's some immune deficiencies that 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 child will not survive to even a year old if we don't intervene. And when do we when does autonomy end and physician intervention start? It's a question that I think it's very complex and I'm hoping to address. And, you know, going back to this piece, I think it's a really case by case decision, but it's um, something that it, it highlights the need for education, eliciting patients' values, understanding their concerns, and showing that 
treatment decisions can change during the course of a patient's lifetime or in you know pre versus post or during pregnancy patients perspectives can change and you know this this was an example of really how i think medical ethics is very plausible and very practical and something that clinical immunologists are probably seeing on a not infrequent basis well, Dr. Bucky, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us. This was a, a very enlightening and important conversation, and I, I, I hope that you sparked some interest in our listeners. Uh, before we depart, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, just a couple final points. So it is my opinion that while ethics has not previously been a focus of research in allergy and immunology, further research and education on medical ethics is really fundamental to our roles as allergists and immunologists. And I hope after listening to today's episode that others will find interest in this topic and there will be more opportunities for this type of work going forward. And to take a step back, you know, as allergists and immunologists, we care for patients of all ages. We manage conditions that are acute, chronic, mild, life-threatening, and our conditions that we care for are not just limited to a single organ, but involve the whole body. And so we are faced with ethical dilemmas on almost a daily basis, regardless of the practice setting that you are um, working in. And I anticipate that the dilemmas and questions will not only become more frequent, but possibly become more complex as medicine continues to evolve and we develop more and more personalized approaches in medicine. And I believe that with a foundation in ethics, we can provide increasingly humanistic and patient-centered care. And lastly, um, to wrap up, thank you for the listeners for tuning in. I hope you found this interesting. If you ever have questions about medical ethics or want to discuss the role of medical ethics in allergy and immunology, I am always happy to speak about this topic. Um, it's a topic I care very deeply about. And lastly, just want to thank you, Dr. Stukas, for this opportunity. It's really been truly a privilege to have the time to speak with you today. You are a personal role model to me, and so it's been an honor to have this time with you, and thank you for all your support. Oh, it's my pleasure, and thank you again. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. Please visit www.aaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through Apple Podcasts, Amazon, iHeartRadio, or Spotify so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.